The equation that describes how the dependent variable y is related to the independent variables x1, x2, etc. out to xp and error term epsilon is called the multiple regression model which is y equal beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 plus etc. plus beta p times xp plus the error term epsilon where beta 0 is the unknown value of the intercept and beta 1 to beta p are the unknown slope parameters. In most cases you will never know the betas. Epsilon is a random variable called the error term. In most cases you'll never know the error terms. The equation that describes how the mean value of y is related to the p independent variables is called the multiple regression equation which is the expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 plus yada 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 plus beta p times xp. Notice that the error term is gone. It's gone because the expected value of the error term is equal to 0. A simple random sample is used to compute sample statistic. So we did this in chapter 3. We computed the sample mean denoted x bar and we did that because we don't know the population mean mu. Um, we can use that same data to compute the sample standard deviation denoted s because we don't know the population standard deviation sigma. Likewise in multiple regression we can use the random sample to compute sample statistics. The B's. B0 is the intercept. B1 to BP are the estimators of the slope coefficients in multiple regression. The B's, as I'll call them, are used as the point estimators of the unknown parameters the betas. Beta 0 is the true intercept of the model. Beta 1 to beta p are the true slopes of the model. The betas are like the mu, the sigma, they're unknown. The b's are like x bar and s. We can use the sample data to compute them. The equation that best describes how the predicted value of y is related to the p independent variables is called the estimated multiple regression equation. It looks very similar to the previous two equations. The predicted value of y is denoted y hat. y hat is the predicted value of y. And it equals b0, not beta 0, but b0 plus b1 times x1 plus b2 times x2 plus yada 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 plus BP times XP. In conducting multiple regression analysis, the first step typically taken by economists is to formulate a research question. For example, how has welfare reform affected employment of low-income mothers? Well, there are a few issues we have to talk about. Issue 1. How should welfare reform be defined? Since we're talking about aspects of welfare reform that influence the decision to work, we include the following variables. Welfare payments allow the head of a household to work less. TANFBN3, that variable is equal to the real value in 1983 dollars of the welfare payment to a family of three. TANFBN3, TANF benefit three, is going to be the variable x1, the first independent variable. The Republican-led Congress passed welfare reform twice, both of which were vetoed by President Clinton. Clinton signed it into law after Congress passed it a third time in 1996. All states put their TANF programs in place by the year 2000. Now TANF is just 
uh, the temporary assistance for needy families. It's the new welfare program. So the variable 2000 is a dummy variable. It is equal to 1 if the year is 2000, 0 if it is 1994. Now the year 2000 is going to be the second independent variable in the multiple regression analysis. So we're going to denote, denote it as X2. Families receive full sanctions if the head of household fails to adhere to state's work requirements. A full sanction is where the state government tells a family that you're not going to get any money in the TANF program because the head of household fails to adhere to a work requirement. So the variable full sanction is a dummy variable that is equal to one if the state adopted a full sanction policy. Zero otherwise. This is the third independent variable. So we're going to call this one X3. Issue two, how should employment be defined? Well, one might use the employment population ratio of low income single mothers, LISM, low income single mothers. The employment population ratio, EPR, equals the number of low income single mothers that are employed divided by number of low income single mothers living in a particular state. Economists used theory or intuition to determine what the true regression model might look like. We use graphs to derive testable hypotheses. Now what follows on this slide and the following slide will not be on the test. In the graph below we have household consumption on the y-axis and leisure of the head of household, mom or dad, on the x-axis. The dark heavy downward sloping line is the household's budget line. Now if the head of household chooses to leisure 80 hours a week, then the head of household is working zero hours per week. Now if they're earning, if they can make a wage of $10 per hour, zero times 10 means consumption is zero because this household won't have any income. Now as the household works more, income goes up, therefore consumption goes up. This black curve labeled U0 is an indifference curve. Generally speaking, the further the indifference curve is from the origin, the happier the household is. Again, indifference curves and budget lines will not be on the exam. Now, the optimal solution, which you'll learn if you take an intermediate micro course in microeconomics, the optimal solution is where the indifference curve is just tangent to the budget line which is this point right here. At this point, the head of household is leisuring 40 hours per week, which means they're working 40 hours per week. Now, 40 hours per week of labor is paid at a rate of $10 per hour. 10 times 40 is 400. So the household has earnings equal to $400 if they're not saving, which is a reasonable assumption for a low-income single household, then they can consume $400 per week. Now, if the government decides that they want to help out low-income single households with a $300 weekly check, then the head of household can choose 80 hours of leisure, which means they're not working. If they're not working, they have zero earnings. But because they receive a $300 check, they can have $300 in consumption per week. Such a policy represents a parallel shift in the budget line. As the person works more and more and more, their earnings and consumption go up. And at this point, the government's just going to give them a $300 check. So it's a parallel shift in the budget line. This allows 
the household to be on a higher indifference curve. The optimal solution allows the household to consume more and allows the head of household to work less. Here at the final optimal solution, the household is leisuring, the head of household is leisuring for 55 hours per week. And if they can devote 80 hours to work in leisure, 80 minus 55 means the head of household is only working 25, 25 hours per week. 25 hours per week times a wage of $10 per hour is $250. Add $300 to that, and the household's consumption is $550 per week. So, receiving the welfare check of $300 per week means the head of household can reduce their hours worked by 15 hours. Hence, economic theory suggests the following is not true. Beta 1 is equal to 0. Now, beta 1 is the slope in a regression model where y is hours worked or the employment population ratio, and x1 is the amount of a welfare check. So economic theory is suggesting that the value of a welfare check affects the decision of low-income households to work or not. In the previous slide we used a graph. Well, we can use a mathematical model, an equation, to derive testable hypotheses. Again, the information on this slide is not testable. The head of household maximizes her utility which is a function of her consumption level and the amount of leisure she consumes. We assume that utility function is equal to, say, the square root of consumption times leisure. Now she maximizes her utility subject to two constraints. This constraint is her time constraint. Hours worked plus leisure equals 80. Okay, So if she's leisuring for 40 hours, what is H? Well, 40 plus 40 is 80, so hours worked would be 40. If she's leisuring for 55 hours a week, what is H? 25 plus 55 is 80, so hours worked would be 25. This here is the budget constraint. Her consumption is equal to the payment she receives from government plus her wage times how many hours per week she works. So initially maybe the payment is zero. So we'd have her consumption equal to zero plus ten times H or simply ten times H. Now after the government passes or enacts a law that gives low-income single mothers a $300 per month, a week check, the P now is 300. So our consumption constraint would be C equal 300 plus 10 times H. Now the solution to this problem is the optimal level of leisure, L star, is equal to the payment divided by 2 times the wage plus 40. Now if we differentiate L with respect to P, we get 1 divided by 2 W, which is positive because wages are not negative. This implies that the change in H divided by the change in P is negative, which implies that beta 1 is going to be negative. Beta 1, remember, is the slope in a regression model where y is the employment population ratio of low-income single mothers and x1 is the size of a welfare payment. So economic theory suggests the following is not true, that this slope 
is not equal to zero. 